And this is Deion Dawkins, man. And you're listening to The Scoop on OwlScoop.com. You already know. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to The Scoop, OwlScoop.com's podcast. This is Season 6, Episode 39. I'm John DiCarlo, back with you again with Sam Cohn. Sam, what's going on, buddy? How are you? Good. I'm hanging in there. I am entering my final week of living in Philadelphia for the summer, moving home for like a month ish. And then before I move into my new place. So um, it's sort of a stressful time of like, I have to start. Uh, I've started planning my move out. Uh, other than that, things are good. No complaints yourself. Can you bring me back some lobster rolls when you come back? Oh, definitely. When we have our Alice scoop barbecue, that'll be my, uh, that'll be my contribution. That'd be great. That'd be great. Just like maybe two or, or 20 of them. <laughs> exactly Vac- vacuum sealed um though we've got a, a great uh, i think you guys are going to really enjoy this podcast this week as all of you are aware uh name image and likeness we talked about this before we've got mailbag questions about it uh became official on july 1st this has been coming a long time coming and there's so much out there so many hot takes what is going to happen what's not going to happen is this going to help temple is temple positioned well enough to take advantage of this how will this affect recruiting how will it affect team culture all that stuff and we thought what better person to talk to than tilo kunkel tilo is an associate professor in temple school of tourism and hospitality management he's also the director of the sport industry research center he has researched this stuff uh he wrote a paper about it that came out in march Uh, his research has been covered in usa today espn so temple really has an in-house expert on this as they you know, figure out how they're going to support their student athletes. He is our guest on the podcast this week. Uh, you'll hear from him in a second. I think you guys are going to really enjoy this interview. Again, we got some great mailbag questions too. So thank you to our alscoop.com subscribers who submitted some, some uh, great questions. And uh, yeah, we'll talk a, uh, a little bit later down the line. We'll, we'll give you uh, some football and basketball recruiting updates as well. Again, a reminder, if you have not subscribed to The Scoop, uh, please do on Apple Podcasts. Spotify, Spotify, wherever you um, get your podcasts. And uh, again, something to keep an eye on. If you're not an alscoop.com subscriber, we will be sometime within the next month or so running a, a special for new subscribers. If you're a Temple student, you do get a free year of Alscoop. Uh, so there are directions on the website as to how you can sign up for a free subscription and uh, get the best coverage of Temple athletics out there. We're a little biased, but hey. Okay. We put in the work. Course, we're, and, we're allowed to be biased when it comes to this stuff. Yes. Yes. This is the one time we're allowed to be biased. Yep. Well, where fairness and objectivity doesn't necessarily matter as much, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get right into this interview with Tilo again. He's um, again, pretty much, you know, covers hopefully everything that you guys would, would want to know and hope to know about NIL, how it re- affects recruiting. What can coaches like Aaron McKee, Tanya Cardo's a Rod Carey do and not do. Um, you know, I think anything that's on your mind, he's going to answer it and uh, really enjoyed the conversation. So we'll get this interview started here and we'll react to it on the other side. All right. We are thrilled on this week's episode of The Scoop to have uh, Temple Professor Tilo Kunkel with us. Uh, again, all of you know that name, image, and likeness has really been the most prominent issue. Uh, in college sports right now. We've known it's coming. And uh, who better to talk to about this issue than someone who's really been an expert on it, who has has researched it. Uh, Tilo is an associate professor in Temple School of Tourism and Hospitality Management. He's also the director of the Sport Industry Research Center. He's also a licensed snowboard, ski, and windsurfing instructor. And he's also played competitive soccer in Australia and Germany. Uh, Tilo, you have such an interesting and diverse and uh, accomplished background and career. And I feel like I only got into probably half of what you've done in that short time there. Um, and we'll look forward to getting into more of that stuff in our interview. Uh, first of all, just thanks for being with us today. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. I'm feeling great. Thanks. Uh, Teal, you're, you're, you're teaching, and I know so many people are, are really interested in this. And Temple uh, just did a story about you for their main website. You're teaching a brand new class called Personal Branding of Athletes name, image, and likeness. So you're obviously t- 
teaching a class, again, that's literally covering the main issue that's dominating college athletics right now. You've been studying this stuff for a while. You, you put out a paper about it in March with that had, I thought, a ton of really interesting stuff that we'll get into. How long have you had this class ready to go? And, and can you give us a glimpse of what's on the syllabus? Because I imagine that a ton of people are going to be interested in it. Yeah, we do get quite a bit of interest in it uh, at the moment already, which is great to, to hear. And um, the, I guess I've been working in this field for, I started researching branding about 10 years ago and started with league branding, then team branding, event branding, and really have gotten more and more into athlete specific branding as social media has grown more and more. And as athletes have really developed more of their personal brands. So really yeah, focused on athlete branding for the last five years. And um, the name, image and likeness of student athlete has always been an, an interest of mine because I didn't believe with the NCAA's stand on not being able to monetize their name, image and likeness. So and I decided that to do something about the, the arguments and disproving the arguments and that the NCAA made. So we've, we set out to to do exactly that. And the paper that you mentioned that has been published in March, we started collecting the data for that research project in 2017. So it's wow. been a long research project, it's been a long data collection of um, over a year with several data collections and so on. Um, so from initial idea to then people telling me in the review process that this is not needed, we don't need to, this research as um, we know all about any, any of this issue in college sport to then getting an amazing resonance in, um, from the media that once it's been published as in, hey, this is actually really relevant. I'm like, I thought so. <laughs> uh, so that, that's really nice to, to see. And then the uh, course I've talked to our dean about a year ago saying that, that name image like with California signing their bill earlier and, and I've I said that we needed to do something in regards to preparing our students for for that. Not only not only those who are student athletes, but those who will be working with student athletes. So the course that you mentioned will be for student athletes that want to brand themselves. It will also be for those wanting to work with student athletes. So those are in college athletics or even someone who wants to work on the brand and sponsorship side, as in, hey, there is this whole new market of student athlete and Yes, they can market themselves like other influencers, but there are some specifics that people need to take into consideration. So when you look at the course content, it's really all about, OK, well, how do I brand myself? What's the importance of branding? But then also, what is the unique sport specific ecosystem? So they need to consider how do they need to consider the university brand, the NCAA, the, conf the federation, uh, the conferences? Uh, and so on. So that we can really get down into into the nitty gritty de details of of those brands as well. And then we're going to really look at honing down on building that personal brand and then looking at how that can be monetized in in a way that in more than just a sponsorship or a quick shout out way, but then also in a more strategic way and how to select sponsors, uh, how to make strategic decisions as in what to look out for, what are the benefits of a specific sponsor versus others. It's not only money. There are lots of other things to consider and we'll, we'll go through all of that. So at the end of the class, those who, those who are students athletes will have a little bit of their own sponsorship proposal ready. And those who are working with student athletes will know and understand a lot more about that monetization process as well. Did the classes, I, I'm going to guess that the class filled up quickly, but it, it, is it is it full? I I read that it's a it's an online class. Is it filled up already? It's not full yet, so there's still opportunities. Uh, but I think athletics is promoting it right now, so mm -hmm. I would assume that there will be quite a few student athletes. But it's open for anyone from from Temple, so it doesn't need that that person doesn't need to be all, all students don't they don't need to be enrolled with STHM or uh, being a student athlete. So anyone in communication or in, in the marketing or any of the Fox schools, any, anyone really is, is welcome and uh, in the class. So we'll start from scratch and, and we go from there. Tilo, we, we have a couple of mailbag questions about this. You mentioned that athletics is promoting the class. I think a lot of 
I, I think so many fans will probably be interested in asking you, does, has athletics consulted you about this? And I don't know if you can get into this or not. I mean, it sounds like they're promoting the class when something this important comes up, that's changing the face of college athletics for, you know, years to come. Does someone like a Fran Dunphy or someone in the administration reach out to you and say, Hey, you've been, you've been researching this for a while. We want to pick your brain. Can you talk about that at all? Have they, have they reached out to you or consulted you about this? We are in conversation right now. So we are also looking at rolling out more classes for student athletes in particular for student athletes um, when they onboard Temple University. So when they're in their, in their freshman year, as well as running some certificate programs uh, for those who have been with Temple for, for a while now. So we're really, we're pretty much ready to, to scale, scale that up, that, that content, mm-hmm. as I've, I've had quite a bit of that content already developed and ready to go for the fall. So now with the uh, ruling on July 1st, it was, it was, I mean, certainly made things a lot easier that I was basically ready to, to execute. Um, but we, we will have four classes for student athletes at STHM as well this fall. So really preparing them um, for what it's about to come. You know, you, you've done, as I mentioned before, you've done so much great and interesting research on this. And I think one of the things that I think Temple fans might find interesting is, is your assessment that the value when it comes to NIL, as you said, lies within the individual and not really the institution itself. And again, I think Temple fans might find that interesting because I think the, the knee-jerk reaction from the outside looking in is that this is going to create a bigger divide between the haves and the have-nots. And you know, to take it a further step ahead, people will say, okay, all the, all the schools that have basically been you know, taking care of kids on the down low, it's just going to make it easier for them. But it sounds like, if I'm understanding this correctly, that your research might indicate that that's maybe not going to be the case, that, that NIL could have just as much value for you know, someone on the gymnastics team at Temple or someone on the softball team at USF or something like that. Can you kind of talk about that a little bit more? Because I think your research, as I understand it, might maybe dispel some of those notions. I think some of those notions are absolutely correct. That media attention and those sports that are in the media and the mainstream media, national media, they are certainly in an advantage because they get that amplification. Right. But our research shows that uh, the institution itself has a, a small impact. So it's really on the athlete to build their own brand. And I don't see any reason why there shouldn't be a superstar athlete social media superstar athlete at Temple. So even they may not go pro in their sport, they could still end up with hundreds of thousands of followers and be millionaire influencers down the road if they built their personal brand uh, correctly. Now, they're certainly as of being at a top school. And when you, we, when you say those schools that have, that are the halves and the halves not, I honestly think Temple is one of the halves because what we have is one of the biggest markets in the nation at our doorstep. So it's making a big difference as a student athlete. If I'm entering a market with, such as Philadelphia with 1.8 million and thousands of businesses that can basically sponsor me that that I can tap into or if I'm somewhere in the middle of well I don't want to say the middle of nowhere but if I'm in a small college town somewhere out west in the middle of nowhere so uh, it's certainly an advantage that um, we have a temple and it's one that we shouldn't underestimate in terms of attracting talent and in terms of brand building. There is a lot of, a lot of opportunities that can come from being in a major area, major metropolitan area here. Tilo, Hello. Another, oh, Sam, let me ask one more quick question here before I turn Go things over to Sam. Um, That's okay. I think another thing that, that fans, and again, that there's been, I, I feel like it's been a long time since fans have really just kind of latched on like, you know, between this and the transfer portal, yeah, th- th- these are two things that are really going to uh, change things. Another thing I think the fans are really eager to find out is, and again, as someone who's researched this and is an expert on it, you know, there are different bills in different states. As you understand it, if you had to walk fans through this, when it comes to NIL, what could, could you give fans what a, a scan of what Temple coaches can do and not do when it comes to talking about NIL to recruits? 
So what we cannot do is pay the athletes. Mm -hmm. So we can't take someone else's tuition and say, hey, you're a top star athlete. We're going to recruit you and we're going to pay you for this. What the coaches can do is say, you're a top star athlete. Here is how we support your personal brand building and how we can support you monetizing that personal brand. And that could be anything, uh, making sure people get the right introduction to sponsors and, and really providing that publicity. I mean, it's as simple as making sure that these athletes and their social media accounts are actually tagged on all of the social media accounts that Temple Athletics puts out. So if the athlete has a, pri- has a public Instagram account or a public Twitter account, it's as simple as making sure that I tag the actual athlete and provide exposure to a potential target audience. That's cost effective because it doesn't cost anything other than a little bit of attention to detail and a little bit of care. And it's super effective. One of our other research projects where we looked at athletes at a major event and how they grow their personal brand is showing that they can network with one another and particularly tag one another and provide shout out to one. At least something that these athletes on the Temple teams can do. And that's certainly something that we are going to cover also in the classes. And there's some really simple ways of increasing that exposure that we we want to make sure that these athletes can do and even if it's not the coach even if it's not temple athletics it's working together um, collaborating with other teammates or with others other that are not teammates but that have a similar target audience Gillo, a lot of your research uh, is focused on the intersection of strategic management and marketing with a focus on sports. Just to provide some context for our listeners, how did you first get into that field and kind of find yourself researching that on a much deeper level? I was always interested in what marketing can do because at the core, it's all about what consumers want. Without being able to satisfy consumer needs, no organization will be able and that will then have imp- have implications for the strategic management of the organization. So how can we structure the organization in a way to satisfy those consumers? So it's more than marketing. We always think it's, this is the product. But with the strategic management, it's a lot more that's, that's behind that. And it's about the structure. It's about how the departments are set up in the organization and what the organization does with other organizations and how they collaborate how they work together and particular as i said with strategic management you're also looking at that corporate culture how that corporate culture then influences marketing and vice versa so what i put out needs to be authentic and needs to be aligned with what who i actually am as an organization and that also has implications for the personal branding of of individuals or of these student athletes as as well as my personal brand up in a strategic way in order to attract a, a right target audience. So marketing is always often often seen as a one-shot approach, as in we do one promotion, we do a, a social media campaign, etc. But to me, it's all about strategically setting it up and driving how the organization is set up based on the consumer needs and wants. And you mentioned the, the, the paper that came out in, uh, in March of this year that you started the research back in like 2017. Can you talk us through some of your findings from that research about sponsorships, helping athletes develop brands, and maybe kind of give us a little bit of insight into some of the specific things that you'll be teaching uh, in your class this fall? So when we looked at the, the NCAA market in 2017, the NCAA made the three big claims as in they don't allow student athletes to monetize their personal brand because it's amateurism, because the uh, value is with the institution, and because student female student athletes would be at a disadvantage from big claims. And the claim number one in terms of amateurism has been disproven many times. I mean. Um, that was not something that was of interest and as I said has been researched and disproven several times and with the emergence of social media we looked at the market and said you know what I think we can disprove claim two and three through social media data so we looked at the social media data from top tier institutions we looked at Stanford and Clemson all student athletes from those 
And we looked at um, mid-tier institutions, hate to say it, Temple was actually the exact medium uh, in the ranking. Uh, so we looked at Temple and Jacksonville and compared the all student athletes um, from those, those organizations. So in that case, we compared about 19,000 tweets and Instagram posts, et cetera. So um, we scraped the, the, the of those student athletes and then examined it as if they were social media influencers and applied those social media influencer rates that uh, are going rates. We talked to agents, what they would sell a specific shout out to, to a person and so on. We applied all of those metrics and then showed that there were no differences between the male and student athletes, no significant differences between male and student athletes in the sample. So that immediately this we were able to disprove the uh, claim number three. And we saw that there was, small, there was a small impact of the main institution, as in it mattered if you were at the institution, but that was always already uh, only a small influence. So as well as there were major differences within the institution, as well as within sports the same sport of the same institution and that really showed that the that we were able to prove claim this proof claim number two as in the values within this with the institution because if that's the if that's the case then there wouldn't be such diverse and uh, such different following and such different value within the athletes so that's really the core of the findings and that has some implications for uh, sponsors and uh, brands wanting to work with them. Another really interesting finding that I thought was super interesting is that the student athletes that we examined had a much higher engagement rate on their social media accounts than mainstream influencers. So there's the, that has basically implication that this makes their following and that makes their uh, social media much more valuable than the regular influencer that have a comparable number of followers. So that was another as aspect that I think was is worth mentioning that um, for companies, it's really beneficial to work with these student athletes because not only do they have a reach, but then also the engagement. Yeah, that's all really fascinating. And then, you know, you think about over the last decade or so, marketing and branding has become so much more important and prevalent in professional sports, as we've talked about, and athletes are taking on more and more business ventures to capitalize on their image beyond their insane physical talents, which has now kind of trickled down to the, to the collegiate level with NIL. I guess it might be kind of a simple question, but from your perspective, based on the research you've done, how does that ability for college athletes to, to market personal branding change the landscape of athletics? It's going to make it potentially more difficult for athletic programs to uh, monitor what's happened to, that's a, that's a way to potentially compete with sponsors for athletic programs. So now some there may be some brands that say, you know what, I don't want to sponsor Temple Athletics anymore because I can get to the same target group that uh, through a, a few different athletes for probably a lot less of the money. So that will have some implications. It's going to cost more money for athletic programs because recruitment um, will get, this will certainly have an impact on recruitment and name, image and likeness. And it can be used as an advantage um, if done right. And if the athletic program is really supporting name, image and likeness, as in, programs in place to support um, NIL. Um, so that's going to cost money, but it can also have some major advantages as in, well, these student athletes may be a lot happier uh, because they can actually make some money off of their NIL. And, and it's just actually, I mean, it's also just fair. Um, but it also has some other advantages uh, there. I see that as a massive educational opportunity and a massive learning opportunity for student athletes to learn a lot more about business. So if you now have the potential to build and monetize your personal brand, 
and you enter the market down the road and job market and even if you're not going professional you still can build the network you can still build certain skills that are really valuable so if i'm a if i'm a company i'm hiring a marketer down the road and that's my to build a personal brand with a pretty solid following and engagement i know they can sell my product because i know they've sold their own personal brand so I think that's a lot of learning and the same with uh, contract negotiations, personal finance. I think there's a lot of learning that can come from that. And if universities are doing that right. And I think our discussion with Temple Athletics thus far uh, look like we, we have uh, the right approach and it looks like we're doing it. We're doing it right here at Temple. So that can really have a lot of advantages to recruit down the road and say, look, you may want to go to one of our competitor schools, but here is what we can do. Um, and that combined with being in, in one of the biggest markets in the nation for, um, for universities and for bigger programs, I think that can, have, can be a really powerful selling point. So there's a lot of positives and there are, there are some, some challenges that come for college sport. Gil, just to, to follow up on that, so you're saying if like if Aaron McKee or Rod Carey or Tanya Cardoza, if they're out on the recruiting trail, they can actively say to a recruit, hey, like, let's say they're recruiting some hypothetical player in the city of Philadelphia. Aaron McKee could could actually say to a recruit, hey, listen, so you're choosing between us and uh, you're choosing between us and and, uh, you know, Clemson. Uh, you're choosing between us and North Carolina State. If you stay home we're in the, we're in a top five media market and, you know, people at home might know you better than they do down there. He's actually able to say that, or does he have to hold off? Do they have to hold off from saying that? He's able to say that. I mean, he's not making promises that he is, that he is a, that he is providing any sort of funding. Um, he can't like, he's, he's saying like, he can't like broke, he can't broker a deal for a student, but he can say there are opportunities here. Correct. Correct. And that's, that's certainly something that Temple Athletics can, Rather than brokering the deals, that's not what they're not allowed to. But what they're allowed to do is host networking events, right? right. It's hosting networking events. And, well, you've you got to make sure, they need to make sure that they're not just inviting, uh, the say, the temp, men's temple basketball team, because that's a Title IX violation, right? So that's certainly something you provide. Now you're providing an opportunity only to male athletes that you're not providing to female athletes for your networking event, but you could invite the basketball to men's team and the basketball women's team. And that's totally fair. And that's totally fair play to provide networking. And if it happens that at these networking events, there are companies that are interested in working with student athletes. Well, that sounds like really good recruitment to me. Mm -hmm. I, this might sound like a, 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 another simple question, but how, just how important is it to have this education in place for student athletes, because I think I'm sure that you've seen it as soon as July 1st came around. So many student athletes were saying, Hey, my DMS are open, hit me up. I'm open for sponsorships. And, you know, nationally, there have been so many hot takes out there, people liking this, people thinking it's going to ruin things. And I'm sure that you've probably cast a pretty keen eye on this, but one of the, I think some people get concerned and think, Ooh, these student athletes could be, what if they're taken advantage of? What if they don't know what they're doing? And so how, given that, that they could maybe be vulnerable, do you, do you, do you see areas where you think, God, this, this education is really important because if they're led in the wrong direction, they could really be taken advantage of. Is that a potential fear in this? And is that why this education is so important for them? I absolutely agree. I think education is the key for this and it's on the institution to be able to and really education to make sure that hey, this $20 shout out is this could be really beneficial or this $20 shout out could be very detrimental to my future career. So I think that's certainly something uh, and you're absolutely right. I've been certainly monitoring that market very well, very, very closely. Um, I'm also the founder of an app where we that's called Sporter and we are helping athletes to brand themselves in a positive way and then also monetize their the following the, the, through experiences that they can sell to other followers 
on the app, so to speak. So, and, and you're absolutely right. It's July 1st hit and we had, we had quite a few athletes reach out and be like, how can I get involved? Um, I'm on the app now. How can I, how can I promote? What can you, how can, can you help us? And, and so on. So the, we've had quite a few student athletes um, from around the nation actually join the app and, and start selling. There are some really exciting opportunity is how we help to monitor it a little bit is we only have certain certain categories that people can can monetize so game with me on social media game with me or provide a social media shout out or do a personalized zoom call or have any of these experiences yes but um that that is one of those ways where at least these student athletes say they don't have to get into only fans in order to sell some experiences they don't have to get into some other platforms i mean that's it's a it's a real aspect here and and it's one of the things where it's like oh you now you're talking about only fans well it's out there and there are quite a few student athletes around the nation that have already joined and um some have gotten their wrists slapped and and some some of these aspects really need to be talked about as in uh, do we can we now get into a adult entertainment probably not and you shouldn't right anything that's 18 plus say away right now um don't get into gambling don't get into tobacco no alcohol all of those aspects but that type of education to provide some oversight and to provide some guidance to these student athletes so there, there are a couple other things i think of here and again i think this is on the minds of a lot of other people when people think how is this going to change college athletics? There are a couple of things that I think of, and, and you wrote about this in your paper. Um, there's the idea that maybe it changes college athletics where um, a student athlete might stay in school for another year because they might say, I don't have to turn pro right away because I've been able to, to, to earn some extra money. Because there's always, you know, from the outside looking in, a lot of people say, oh, these student athletes have a great, they'll graduate with no student debt. They got full scholarships. They, have, they get a cost of attendance stipend, but a lot of people don't realize that beyond that, they still have a lot of financial needs despite being in a fortunate situation with a scholarship. Do you think that the NIL could change things where an athlete might stay in school a year longer and be like, hey, I was able to make $25,000 this year. Do you think that is a change that we could see where student athletes stick around a year longer because they're able to, to monetize things? I think I, I certainly think that that's the case and that some student athletes will stay longer in school and, and instead of going pro, they may they may hold off for a year. I also think that this is really beneficial for some student athletes that come from disadvantaged communities where, yes, they may get a full ride scholarship, but they still need to work and make some extra money to send some money home to support to support the family, etc. So I think that's also one of those aspects because. Going pro is there's very only a small chain, a small part of the of all student athletes are actually and actually internal debate. And do I go pro now? Do I stay another year? But where, what I think is really the big impact is those student athletes that have been thinking about: Can I afford to stay in school, or do I have to drop out because I can't actually? afford this even though i am on a full ride scholarship i still need to send some money home i still need to support family and and i think particular disadvantaged communities and those student athletes from those disadvantaged communities will benefit from this so in a way it's it's i don't want to say leveling the playing field it's helping with leveling the playing field and it's helping attack tackle some of the disproportionate uh, wealth distribution in in the nation i mean it's it's a small part um but it it, it can help um and i'm sure there is somewhere out there in the in the united states there are a few student athletes that have left university because they they couldn't afford to be pro right now um there is somewhere uh, a super bowl winning white receiver uh, that quit school mm -hmm. Um, so I can absolutely see that this is this is changing and this is really helping um, student athletes to either stay in school uh, longer to prolong uh, prolong that that process. I mean, if you think about at the world class level, Katie Ledecky quit Stanford because she could monetize her 
bazillion gold medals that you want. Right. I think it's like two or three. I mean, that's that's certainly something that would also then have benefits for the university. I mean, if you think about it, the media attention of on the school of that that actually has a gold medal winner at the school. I mean, that that's incredible. With what we see now, there are some some Olympic athletes are college athletes at the moment, right? They're they're going. They're still. Uh, they're still going to university, and and if they are if they are really successful, if they bring home gold, and that's a massive brand, and that's those are opportunities that that universities can leverage. I, I think of um, I, I think of I covered Mark Jackson's career when he was at Temple, a basketball player, played for John Chain in the late '90s, and he left a year early and was drafted in the second round of the NBA draft and then played overseas. And I remember talking to Mark as so many other reporters did. And he said, I have to go. I have to take care of, I have to take care of my mother. You know, she, she, she needs my help financially. And I think of, you know, I'm sure a lot of people will think back and say, I wonder how NIL would have helped this person. Mark of course went on to a good career in the NBA and he's doing color commentary for the Sixers. Now on the flip side of Attilo, there's, and I wonder if you put yourself in this headspace too. The other thing that people talk about is, wow, coaches might have, a lot to manage now because some people again from the outside looking in think could nil create some discord create some jealousy on teams where you know somebody might say oh must be nice to be you i i, I heard you just got a twenty five thousand dollar check from a car dealership i don't have that money what do you think that might look like and how much support or education do you think coaches might need here do you think that's do you think that's going to be a growing pain of this too, where coaches are going to say, "Woof, now I'm worried about, is there jealousy on my team? Is there, is there that? And then are my student athletes worrying a little bit more about promoting themselves and marketing themselves and less about their schoolwork and less about their playbook? Do you think that, how much do you think that plays into this? Those are all options. And I think um, the coaches that really, are going to be faced with that most of the time uh, are going to be the coaches that already make quite a bit of money. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't want to talk bad about coaches. I know they're doing a great, great job. Um, but if you particular, when we're talking value deals, such as a Clemson quarterback um, or a UCLA gymnast, I think those, those type of coaches there, they're also not poor themselves. Right. Um, and, and do they need to upskill? They may. And well, that's just part of their job. I hate, I hate to say it. Um, that is now part of their job. They can't just go ahead and say, you know what? I don't want you on social media. I don't, I, I want you have you to have a private profile. I, I want you to, to keep it hush. No, this, this is now part of the game and coaches need to adapt. And there may be some some of these challenges that some some athletes on the team are going to make quite a bit of money. From name, image, and likeness. They're also earned. I mean, it's their name, image, and likeness. And if their their name, image, name, image, and likeness is worth a lot more than that of others, then that's that's their personal advantage. Um, so I think it's something that um, they will need to address in the locker room that is something that they will need to um, really upskill and and i think it's part of the team i mean there's always been some superstar athletes that went pro i mean temple had some first round picks in the in the in the past right where mm -hmm. um where where someone knew that hey in a few months i'm going to be a millionaire right it's it's like that that is a first round pick that's that's what's going to happen so has that been challenging? Probably, but that's just part of the game, and that's part of every team. There are some superstars, and there are some that that are not going to make it pro that won't have all of the money. And I think it's like similar to society. We we need to deal with it in a way, an upskill. Tila, what do you think is the biggest misconception? about NIL right now? Maybe something that you hear constantly and it becomes part of the narrative and you might be sitting there thinking that's, that's a talking point for you, but it's just not true. Is there a, a misconception out there that, that you'd want to clear up and say, hey, I keep hearing this, but that's not the case? I think there's a lot of, lot of different 
opinions around. Um, I think some are really worried that these student athletes are now um, only focusing on their name, image, and likeness, um, and will never, will, won't, won't be, won't be participating. Um, I think that most student athletes, as part of what our data shows, as in about ninety-five percent of the student athletes, their name, image, and likeness value is. Um, it's not as as high as what they would receive from their scholarships and so on. So I think one aspect to keep in mind is that those who now really only for in mind that you probably will want to continue training and want to put your best foot forward on the field or on the court because this is much more valuable than a, a social media shout out for twenty bucks. So keep in mind not to miss your training session keep in mind to not piss off your coach um because of a of a small sponsorship deal i think the the scholarships are still much more valuable than a lot of that nil of most student athletes and so i think that's certainly one aspect to keep reminding them uh the good thing is that they've now had a few months over the summer to um to really you know get get into this and um and educate and upskill and, and look on, but they, um, so I think it's, it's at least not happening while this, the semester, new semester starts. So they had a little bit of time to, to prepare for it. And um, so I think that's certainly helpful. So Tilo, one thing that John likes to do on this podcast whenever we have a guest is to ask them something uh, kind of fun or interesting that they don't normally get asked. And uh, in your case, we spent a lot the, spent the last forty five minutes talking about NIL, but we mentioned at the outset of the show that you played competitive soccer both in Australia and Germany, and that um, one thing I, I, I want to ask you about is like how did you get into uh, being a licensed snowboard, ski, windsurfing instructor. I mean, clearly you have a lot on your plate. There is a lot of research you do in, uh, in addition to being a professor at Temple, but just uh, any experiences you can tell us about or how you kind of got into all that on the side. Yeah, that's that's probably more the, the more fun side of me is I'm really into extreme sports. And uh, I my first degree was sports science. So I was always, I wanted to be a PE teacher. And I really enjoyed that part. And as part of that education, I, I got all of these licenses and, and I really enjoyed it. I spent most of my summers on, on somewhere on the coast, windsurfing, kite surfing, and most of my winters somewhere in the mountains in, in Europe, uh, snowboarding, skiing, which is also why the soccer took a practice in the pre-season. And... Um, but I really enjoyed that that part a lot more, and and that's that also paid the bill back then. So that's that's certainly that's how I financed my my degrees as well. And then at one point I transitioned more into uh, the business side of sports. Um, but I do still enjoy those type of extreme sports, rock climbing, um, kite surfing, and so on. So whenever there's an opportunity, I'll be underwater or on the mountains at some point. And just one more question before I pass over to John for our mailback questions is, as I mentioned, you spent time playing competitive soccer again, Australia and Germany. How do you think your experience playing a sport at a high level, both impacted, helped and kind of played a role in the research that you do and kind of your involvement in, in the research you do in the sports world? I think playing and knowing the sport, um, the sport that you're researching is always helpful. Um, it's also really helpful with researching something is if you can emotionally distance yourself from uh, from the sport and from the actual um, yeah from the actual research. So as part of that, I as part of my research, the more and more I research, the less and less a fan I am. So um, and I think that's actually really good because it provides me the opportunity to be a lot more objective. And I think that's one thing that I always say to our sport business students at, at STHM is that if you are interested in, if you're a sport fan, there is millions of other sport fans out there. You really need to understand the business side of the sport and you really need to learn that. And then it really doesn't matter at that point whether you're selling a ticket for a football game or for a basketball game or a tennis match. Now, the, the sport-specific knowledge is still really helpful when doing so, but that can also be learned. So 
safety is is a real benefit when conducting research and when we when also talking as a consultant so we we also work in and you mentioned that earlier with our sport industry research center we work with some of the the biggest properties in in the nation as so one of the one of the biggest basketball leagues in the world is one of our one of our clients, and we work with them on uh, one of the biggest tennis events in the in the world is one of our clients where we where we support them with our research. And now the the sports specific knowledge is helpful, but then also being able to um, look at it objectively is really beneficial. Tilo, as Sam mentioned, we have a few mailbag questions. So these are coming from, I'm going to read off screen names from our, our message board. These are uh, people who subscribe to our website. So the first question comes from the screen name was Rockland Al. Uh, the question is, what safeguards are in place with the new NIL legislation to prevent wealthy boosters from large programs from reaching out to a current FBS player's high school coach or other third party to offer the player a much higher sum in NIL compensation um, than the players currently re uh, receiving. Um, put another way, how does Temple prevent another school from essentially offering to double the amount of NIL money that a player is currently receiving if the player transfers? <laughs> Very good question. And the answer is we probably don't have measures in place to do so mm -hmm. because now uh, boosters have been able to do some of that in the past under the table. Right. Uh, now it's what prevents a booster from saying, "Hey, I I have a company. I am based in Jacksonville. If you come and play for Jacksonville, I am able. I I'll be you. You will be able to be my number one uh, endorser. And I'm offering you. nothing can prevent." boosters from doing that nothing can the temple can do from from preventing that it's going to happen and it will be part of the game so i think it the main things the temple can do is really provide a value statement to the student in terms of what's the value of coming to temple as i said the big city is certainly a big advantage and the other aspect is the educational part around NIL and what we provide to the to the students in terms of educating them on how to not how to just make a quick dollar, but how to do it properly and how to do it in a sustainable way. Yeah, I think his question kind of hits on what we we're talking about earlier. I think that's everybody's biggest fear is when we, they say, is this just going to baby? Is this maybe just going to essentially legalize the, the cheating that's taken place and kind of have the, the divide between the haves and the have nots? The second part to Rockland Al's question is, can you take us through the Pennsylvania version of the NIL law and address whether that law is more restrictive than laws in other states or places uh, or any other PA school? Does it put Temple at a disadvantage as compared to universities in other states or does it not do so? Full disclosure, I'm not a lawyer, so I will, mm -hmm. I will stay away from making legal claims uh, on record here. Uh, I think... It, Pennsylvania schools are at a disadvantage compared to those states that have signed bills, Georgia, Florida, California, and so on. There are seven states that have signed bills. They are in an advantage because student athletes really don't need to ask their compliance officers in those states. Um, they're able to just go ahead and monetize and take a brand deal. Pennsylvania schools, uh, most student athletes will still be asked to run offerings and deals past their compliance officers. So in that regards, it's speed that is essence, particularly when doing a sponsorship deal, a brand may reach out and say, hey, we have a, a shout out, social media shout out. It needs to go. It needs to go live on Saturday. The social and the compliance officer may not be able to clear that. So speed is going to put some of those states at an advantage. And I think what the NCAA needs to do is uh, roll out a nationwide guidelines um, and they have stayed away from that they have put the burden on the school and that's creating some disadvantages for some other schools but I'm, I'm not able to get into all of the nitty-gritty details on the PA deal. Tilo, just a, a follow-up did you kind of did you kind of think that that was what was going to happen where the NCA because you know the NCA has been hammered about this for years you guys this is a money grab. You're making so much money off the backs of these student athletes. Now NIL comes about. Did you kind of see this coming where the NCA would be like, all right, 
states, schools, you guys figure this out. And I might, I might be taking an unnecessary or unfair shot at them, but when you've just now, when you've said the, the NCAA is kind of essentially taking a backseat to it, did, are you kind of not surprised that they're kind of taking a little bit of a hands-off approach and maybe saying, let's see how this plays out? I am surprised because an organization of that size, I would have expected that they have a plan in, in somewhere in a drawer. And basically they knew it would, it would come. We all mm -hmm. knew it would come one right. day. And I think they, I would have expected that they had a plan somewhere in a draw and be like, all right, now that we can't get around all of this anymore, um, here is how to move forward. Um, I was quite surprised that they don't or even if it, or they may have one but they're not sharing it uh, i'm i was surprised with that um because an organization that size um in my opinion should have a plan another question here i guess we'll the screen name we'll just call it uh it's a crazy screen name we'll call it owl to the to the eighth degree here um and we kind of talked about this a little bit already and we said that fans are really curious about this as it pertains to you um so you, you said that temple has consulted you his question is how many hours a week do you spend working closely with Temple Athletics, consulting them on the direction of setting up a successful NIL education and delivery program? And how aggressively do you think they are working on the issue? I, I, won't, I won't get into hours a week we're working on this. Um, mm -hmm. I know since July 1st, I don't think the, the Temple Athletics administration has uh, slept a lot. So I know their work working very hard on making sure we're ready, particular ones the fall, the fall hits, the fall semester starts. So what I can say is that we will be ready to have something in place that educates our students and we will have something in place where we will run ongoing workshops for those that are already with Temple and we'll make sure to um, provide top top level education to all of our student athletes that's that's as far as i can go obviously the the amount of hours that go into this are substantial um i think everyone involved is working really really hard to make sure that we're delivering uh next question comes from the screen name green street al it's a two-part question he said um is this the end of the world as we know it and i don't mean that in a good way or in your opinion can temple and whatever the new athletic administration looks like, turn this into a difference maker for, for Temple's athletes and programs. As I said, I think it's certainly, we have some of the biggest strategic advantages in the nation in terms of our nation. I mean, there are very few top programs um, in the nation that are in a city as the size of Philadelphia. Um, you, you think about certainly L.A., um, you think about Miami, um, but other than that, I mean, which other schools are really in a downtown area that have top level, that have top level athletics? There are a few, but we are in the top 20 for sure in the nation. So that should put us at a really strategic advantage from um, that I think we have not only within our conference, within the American Athletics Conference, um, certainly that's a big advantage there, but I think we, it will also put us at a big advantage compared to some of the other conferences. I mean, I actually studied a year abroad at, back when I was living in gym, and that's in Columbia, Missouri, it's really small school. Uh, a big school, really small city in terms of the economic activity that's happening in Columbia, Missouri. Yeah, there may be some boosters, but the economic activity, the amount of, of companies, the amount of businesses that student athletes can get involved with there are very limited. So I think it, it really puts us at a strong advantage. I think Temple will be one of the schools that will be a winner out of this NIL. The second part of his question here, and you kind of touched on this a little bit, is he says, secondly, what is the first thing you would do or would have done if you worked in TU leadership to put um, in a leadership position to make an impact? So I guess like, I guess maybe to paraphrase this question, there's so much to this and there's so much, so many moving pieces. If, you know, and again, you, you have a piece in this, you teach a class, 
where, where do you start? What's the first thing? Like if you were Temple's athletic director, what, what, what's the first thing you would, where do you start with this and say, we have to do this before this really catches up? Uh, I bring it down to two main things, framework and communication. And the framework is what you put in place. And that needs to be really solid in terms of how are we going to handle, how are we going to support? Uh, and uh, Temple has already looked into that and say, yes, we're, we're full on board. We're fully student friendly. We're supporting. I know there are some other schools um, that have been very more, a lot, a lot more restrictive. Um, I, I can give you an example. There is a, there's a student athlete on, a, on the Sporter app that joined uh, and a day later, uh, um, uh, I just got from our compliance officer I should not be monetizing my name image and likeness and that is a big 10 school and and they are very a, a lot more restrictive so Temple is really supportive of that so it's it's the framework and putting a proper framework and that framework consists of um, how are we going to, going to support and education is certainly a big piece and then the same, the second part, as I said, uh, communication is how are we communicating that joining Temple will provide them with a world-class education in name, image, and likeness, how to monetize that, how to build it, and how to monetize it, as well as um, what are some of the rules that, that are in place and how beyond the education, what Temple Athletics is actually doing in order to support it. So I think those are the two things. Put a framework in place and really communicate the heck out of the key mark and use it wisely because I think that is going to be one of the biggest recruitment advantages we will have and that we can leverage. Tilo, final mailbag question comes from the, the screen name is Esther Boyer. Now, I don't know how closely you've been following you know, Temple football and Temple basketball over the years, but the question here is, this might be impossible to answer, but if you had to go through Temple basketball history and point out the most valuable NIL of any historic Temple player, who would that be? And this, this person says Deontay Christmas and Pepe Sanchez come to mind as players with the most appeal from, from recent teams. Do you, I don't know if you can answer this, but if you, if you can, are, are there players that you think of that you've watched over the past several years where you think, oh, if NIL existed, I think this, this student athlete could have made a killing or they could have you know, they could have really benefited from this. I don't want to go into names. So right. I think it's, all, it's very high players in the past. And, hey, I think you could have been more value, valuable or you. I think it's, NIL is certainly a lot about the performance. It's a lot about the personality. And it's also a lot about the approach. It's hard work to monetize your, to build your personal brand and to monetize that. So we all see that social media influence as one of the number one jobs that people want down the road, but people don't see that that is actually still a lot of work. Creating that content, putting out that content, editing that content, is, it's a lot of work. So I don't want to get into names of, of any of the basketball or football players because I think any of those, anyone, no matter what their performance level was, anyone could have been a superstar. And that's the beauty of it. It's, it's about performance. Uh, I think you see some division three programs that there are some, some athletes that are like, that are money because they've got a million followers on TikTok suddenly because they can dance. I mean, those are all athletes. Like you're, an, you're a basketball player who can dance. That's awesome. <laughs> so it, that, that's why I think it goes like beyond the performance. It's really, now that's why it's called name, image, and likeness, right? It has these, these aspects that are way beyond the performance. It's what, what, who are you as a person? What's your personality? What's your looks? What do you are? What's your appearance? And what is your lifestyle? Um, what causes and things do you care for? What community do you support? And so on. So, and that goes back to our, our class as well to close the loop here is that's exactly what we'll be covering in the class as well. Like beyond the performance on the field, how do you build your name, image and likeness? How do you build your personal brand and how do you then monetize that? The last, last question I have to close things out here. And again, thank you so much for your time. This has just been awesome. And for you to 
be able to bring so much clarity and expertise to, again, like the biggest story out there in college sports. We greatly appreciate it. I, I teach two classes at Temple. I teach a sports writing class and an advanced sports reporting class, both of which Sam Cohn has done very well in, I'll add. I, one of the things I think of is like, you know, whether you're teaching in person or online, there's the, hey, can I stick around after class to talk to you? I just want to pick your brain about something. And and I love that as an educator. It's fun. That's where you build some of the best relationships. I think of you in this position now and thinking, oh my gosh, what is the fall going to look like for you? How much, how much time do you think you're going to be spending? I mean, like in that first class, do you think you're going to have multiple students saying, uh, Professor Kunkel, can I, can I talk to you after class? I got something I want to run by you. Do you think you're going to run into a lot of that and, and, and managing that? I hope I will because that's yes, my role is not just the 15 minutes in front of the hour and 20 in class, but to me, like class is, is a start of relationship building. Right. Um, I see myself as a, as someone who can provide content and who can provide, uh, who can, who can provide the content in an, I think, engaging way that um, people can get some value out of it. But to me, the, the best students have always engaged beyond the class. They've always looked at how can I get involved with different projects or how, what does that mean to, to me personally? And, um, my office hours are always open. My emails are always open. I'm I'm on all of the socials. So anyone reach wanting to reach out and um, send a tweet and even ask some questions in in my DMs. I mean that that's really like to me. It's it's about supporting our students at Temple. And so I actually I'm uh, sticking around. I want them to stick around. I really hope that there will be some students who are like. How can I how can I increase the impact and what can I do and can you help me with this because that that to me shows they're engaged and that's where learning happens. Tilo, you know, thanks again so much. Again, this was so much fun. Again, it's it's awesome to have someone on on the podcast here to bring a lot of a lot of clarity and context. This can't thank you enough, and hopefully we'll get the chance to talk to you again down the line. Thank you for having me, and I I really imp- appreciate the insightful questions, and uh, I. I'd, I'd love to be back down the road and, and chat further and see, see how it's been playing out. And, and honestly, I mean, uh, also just catch up on, on campus when, when the fall, fall starts. Uh, I think there's a, there's a lot to, to collaborate down the road as well. Thanks for having me. All right. Again, a big thank you to Tilo Kunkel. Some really great, really educational stuff there. Uh, again, I think one of the biggest takeaways, again, going into this, when we put out a call for mailbag questions, so many people wanted to know, essentially, Temple has an in- in-house expert. Are they utilizing this guy? So as you can hear from the conversation, the answer is yes. And he talked a lot about what Temple can do to educate their student athletes. Again, Tilo, uh, we didn't really mention this at the outset before the interview. He's teaching a brand new class, as, as he discussed, called Personal Branding of Athletes, Name, Image, and Likeness. Um, so again, he's teaching a class is covering the, the, the main issue that's dominating college sports right now. And you heard him say near the end there that he likes taking additional questions from students. So, um, so we know that Temple is going to be working with him, utilizing him. Sam, what are your takeaways from the conversation? Yeah. So two things that I thought really stood out to me and, uh, and what he was able to talk about. First of all, he was fantastic. I, and I don't think we could have asked for someone better at this point in time to, to kind of give us some insight into a, Name image like this, but also kind of what Temple's doing, because uh, as he mentioned, as you'd mentioned, that Temple is utilizing his expertise. Uh, the first thing being that something we've talked about or kind of, you know, off the record, you know, I've talked about whatever is like, what is Temple doing? And what is that? What is whatever Temple is doing to help his student athletes? What might that look like? Uh, and one thing, although Temple has not come out with any formal announcement about um, any partnerships they're doing or anybody, anything specific they're doing to help. One thing that uh, Professor Tilo Kunkel mentioned was the Temple's in a position where they can set up. And I think that my, my, my takeaway from what he said is like, they're not thinking about, and they haven't been thinking about like, what is our July 1st plan? What is our August 1st plan? A lot of it from what he was saying to me feels like they're really preparing for the fall, for bringing students back on campus, for getting these teams back together in practices. They weren't exactly planning for like day one where there was those memes where, uh, you know, someone is, a, a student athlete is broke, um, you know, the night before. And then suddenly on July 1st, they have all this money, which was kind of like that 
anticipation of what things uh, what student athletes might be expecting but it sounds like temple's really preparing for the fall and what that might look like is setting up workshops and setting up networking opportunities and um giving kind of equal and fair opportunities to uh, you know football, basketball, but also all the Olympic sports, just as this kind of like equality across the athletics department as a way to connect student athletes with brands and with partnerships. And they're not doing, they're not the one, as you had mentioned in our interview, they're not the ones brokering the deal, but they're the ones saying like, these are the ways we can kind of introduce you to the people in the right circles as a way to help them. The other really interesting thing I, I took away from our conversation was that in his research, um, he had said, you know, the thousands of schools they had looked at Temple was kind of like dead middle in terms of uh, influence and in terms of um, the reach they're getting uh, and the way they're able to kind of not not like shift the market, but like the way they're able to uh, kind of be involved in in the like way it's going to like play into name, image and likeness and like the reach they have in terms of um, social media and then how uh, the, the student athletes have like in the way he talked about comparing student athletes reach on social media to influencers with like the same amount of um same amount of, it was same following i thought all that was really interesting yeah definitely um hopefully uh again this is as we said probably just a part of an ongoing conversation and uh, i think there are going to be a lot of uh a lot of interesting developments with this again there's so much that that goes into it you know i thought i thought his take on you know the coaching piece of it was pretty direct and he was like you know yeah could be something interesting for coaches to take on. But, and again, I'm paraphrasing what he said, as you guys heard, he's like, these coaches also get paid a lot of money uh, to begin with. And it's something that they are going to have to manage. So uh, hopefully again, we'll have him on uh, down the line. Again, this is one of those ongoing stories like the transfer portal that is going to continue to very much change the face of, of college when, athletics. And when we get off this podcast, I might go look at my schedule and see if there's a way I can swap a class or maybe fit in taking personal branding, name, image, and likeness with them. Because it sounds really interesting. It could, in some capacity, could help a lot of the coverage that we do or a lot of the recording that we do. Absolutely. All right, so we will finish this off in getting you guys caught up with the world of Temple football, Temple basketball, recruiting, everything that's coming with it as we sit here in mid-July. We'll start with football first. Uh, since we last talked, the big news is that Rod Carey hired Woodrow Wilson high school coach Preston Brown as his director of player personnel. Um, so what they're doing here is, again, hiring one of the top coaches in the area. Again, I, I think on our message boards, you know, people tend to say, okay, Rod Carey and his staff, most of these guys are from the Midwest. They need Philly ties. They need Philly ties. They need ties to this area. Well, you just, you recently named Gabe Infante your recruiting coordinator, and Gabe was by far one of the best high school coaches in America at St. Joe's prep, not just in the, you know, in the, uh, in the city, but really in the country, won four state titles in nine seasons at the prep. Now you're bringing in Preston Brown, uh, who has really done again, a, a great job at Wilson just over the river uh, in Camden. Uh, so he's again, he's a, a, an important local voice on the scene there. Um, they had, uh, consecutive state titles there in, in, in South Jersey, uh, coach guys like Fidel Diggs, Amari Clark, Marcus Johnson. Uh, and he's had three guys come through Wilson who are current temple players. Now Mahim McCargo, Trayvon King and Dysher Clary. So, um, you know, a, a good, important hire there for Rod Carey. We're hoping to, hoping to talk to Preston at some point next week, we might be able to catch up with him again. The four verbal commitments the temple has so far are, Sorry about the ping there, guys, on the getting a, an iMessage here. Um, you have two guys from Philly in Reese Clark, and then most recently, uh, Khalif Kemp from Imhotep. I think that you know he's committed uh, in the time between podcasts here. A guy that didn't play last season, uh, but one of the better players in Philly is a weak side defensive end, had played at Newman Gretti. Uh, Gabe Infante was part of his recruitment. So now you have two of the better players in Philly. Uh, in, you know, in Khalif Kemp and Reese Clark from St. Joe's Prep. He was the first verbal commitment from the class. And then you have the two guys from North Jersey in Makai Green, uh, who we've talked to, and Kyle Lewis uh, from East Orange High School, right? Uh, yes, East Orange High School. And then Makai Green from South Orange High School up in Jersey. So uh, four guys who are currently verbally committed. Again, we'll have more 
uh, ongoing football recruiting coverage as the summer progresses. And then on the basketball side of things, again, you know, Sam can talk about this in a second. I'll turn it over to him. You know, Sam was at both weekends of Philly Live over at St. Joe's Prep. The AAU, AAU season moves on uh, as we press into July. Uh, as of now, it looks like Temple might have one scholarship to give to the 2022 class. But again, that could change. Uh, we know that could change. And, um, you know, on one hand, it looks like they might want to prioritize a big. And Sam, I'll, I'll ask you to mention some of the names who have gotten offers here. But it also sounds like they've put a lot of effort into recruiting Dan Skillings. Uh, Rivals recently put out something where they talked about guys that could be on the verge of, of uh, in their headline here, crashing the Rivals 150, Dan Skillings from Roman Catholic, who Sam has written about a lot. He's talked to Dan Skillings. He's done a great assessment of his game. Uh, Temple has made him a priority. They had all three staff members down in Atlanta watching him recently, but he's not the only guy that they're you know recruiting right now. So Sam, I'll turn this over to you. What's going on in the world with Temple Hoops recruiting? There's a, there are a couple of uh, a couple of bigs out there. Again, nobody has verbally committed yet. Christian Furman committed to VCU. I think between you know our last pod and, and this one, we knew he was leaning that way. So Christian Furman's off the board. Um, where do you see things headed right now? Who are some of the new names that Temple's involved with? Yeah, so I get I guess most prominently you mentioned Dan Skillings. Uh, you said that you as you had mentioned the t- Temple staff is pretty high on him um, and was making him a priority on the recruitment trail. He was someone I saw play at Philly live. Um, someone I think that they, if, if all goes well, I think they'd love to bring in. Um, but as you mentioned, his recruitment has blown up a lot this summer. He's, um, he's just got my really, yeah, he's played really well this summer um, in the live period. Uh, you did mention that there are, Temple does have likely have one scholarship left um, that could there are they're likely prioritizing like a wing or big someone kind of like a Dan Skilling stature Skilling's I'd written about that he kind of prefers to have like be able to show his more guard skills but someone with a bigger a bigger size bring in some size bring in some stature to that lineup so they could be prioritizing a big the situation is also pretty fluid where there's a poss- it's not out of the realm of possibility they could find themselves you know holding off on that scholarship to grad transfer earlier uh, or closer to the start of the season but uh, the, the three names I think worth mentioning right now that um that they've extended offers to are two from the t- class of 2022 and one from the class of 2024. The two from um, this incoming class are 610 center Edward Namoko from Riviera Prep in Miami, Florida, and another 610 big man, uh, Ifan Prince. Um, I apologize for butchering this name, Ifo Chukwu um, from Covenant Day School in Charlotte, North Carolina. Those are two big guys in the class of 2022 that um, are, on, at least on Temple's radar, both hold offers and could potentially be names to look out for in the coming weeks and the coming months. And then the other one is 2024 point guard. He's 6'6". His name's Rock Lee. Pretty sure his full name is Jalen Lee, but he goes by Rock, R-O-C. Uh, he's from Riverwood High School in Atlanta, Georgia. So those are a few of the names to keep an eye on. The three guys who have received Temple's most recent offers, two of which uh, big men that are probably more prioritized uh, as it stands right now. And as we've been saying, likely one scholarship that could either go to uh, a guy like Dan Skillings, or maybe they prioritize adding depth to that big man rotation. Or as I mentioned before, it's uh, the situation's fluid. There's a, there's definitely a possibility they could hold off for a grad transfer. Someone that they really feel confident can come in and move the needle because I know Temple's staff feels pretty confident with the guys they have right now. Uh, Just another quick note to pass along. Uh, some people had asked about a tweet they saw saying the temple had offered a player named Zy mortal from Peabody high school, um, checked into that with multiple people. Temple did not offer, uh, Zy mortal. Um, so anything you've seen to the contrary written or reported anywhere, uh, that is not the case. If it was, it was not fact checked. So that is not a, an offer that's out there, uh, from temple. Just wanted to, to clear that up. Uh, Sam, it's, I'm going to ask you to, to look at your crystal ball here and it's unfair because it's July and things could change, but, um, you know, again, this looks like they are really throwing a lot of effort into recruiting Dan Skillings and with good reason. Um, I'll ask you to give it real quick before we wrap up here, give me a reason why they should prioritize a big, 
And then give me a reason why it would also make sense to kind of put all their eggs in one basket and say, we got, we got to get a kid like Dan Skillings. And if we get Skillings, we're good, regardless of whether or not we can get another big, what are the pluses and minuses of each scenario? I think where they're at right now, it makes sense to prioritize a guy like Dan Skillings and to put it, as you said, put all your eggs in one basket for him, just because he really, and as we said a thousand times on this podcast kind of fits, um, fits the mold of kind of like what they need and what they're growing and what they're adding. He's a guy that, uh, is steadily working on improving his ball handling and being comfortable with the ball in his hands. And, and I've written about this a little bit dating back to Philly Live that most of what he was working on is not necessarily point guard skills. It's not to be able to be a guard. It's to be able to have guard skills so they can feel comfortable with the ball in his hands in the, in the essence where the ball comes off the rim and anybody on the floor can grab it and push the ball. So they're not having to slow the game down and find a guard. Anybody can feel comfortable with the ball in his hands. He's really long and athletic. The one thing I really liked about his game is the way he can attack and like full and like full extension finish around the rim. He's got a soft touch. He can finish through traffic, but the way he can use his length to finish around guys to get that cleaner looks of the hoop um, to kind of maneuver through the paint. So he's, he's pretty shifty uh, for his size. Uh, he's got good hands and good feet. So, and I think defensively is one of the more intriguing parts of his game for for Aaron and his staff is the fact that he's just all over the floor. His hands are waving constantly. He's diving on loose balls. So he's a real workhorse. And uh, I think it's not, a, I wouldn't say it's a bad idea for them to put all their eggs in one basket for him. Um, the negative is that maybe you lose out on another guy that if Skillings decides to go somewhere else, then maybe you're not as invested as someone else that could be a good, uh, a good second option. Um in terms of guys that they could look to next, I, I don't have any names that I would say like, that's a guy like I would, if you're not getting skillings that they would get him. I know Javon Adams is someone that the Sear Miller mentioned on our podcast was uh, he was pretty excited about the, him as a prospect, just in general temples been in touch with him. He was on campus a few weeks back, but has not received an official offer from temple. Um, trying to think of other guys that have gotten, there aren't, there's anybody else that I feel like has gotten an offer. I mean, the two, big guys that they've prior, that they really prioritized early were Christian Furman and Ernest Uday. Ernest Uday is bound for a bound for a very successful college career and Christian Furman chose VCU. And I think that was uh, a decision the Temple staff was okay with it kind of towards the end. It was looking like he was leaning more towards VCU anyway. Um, so now they're looking ahead to anybody else that really excites them. Uh, They've been down in Georgia, and I know they've done some recruiting, as I mentioned, down in Florida with um, the 6'10 center, Edward from Riviera Prep. So I, I'd say there's there's two there's two ways of looking at it. They're putting all their eggs in one basket with Dan Skillings. And to kind of answer your question, the backup is they're, they're sending out offers to a couple other big men that might be intriguing to them that could fill they could kind of fill that hole in the rotation um, down the line because they are potentially looking at a graduation in Jake Forrester if he doesn't take his uh, – his um his extra COVID year. Mm -hmm. Well, stay tuned. Good stuff from Sam. Thank you, Sam. Uh, again, recruiting is a ever evolving thing. Uh, we'll keep you updated on the latest football and basketball recruiting news. Big big thank you again to Tilo Kunkel for joining us on the scoop this week and just really bringing all of the the NIL stuff into focus. Again, we'll we'll try to get him on the pod again somewhere down the line again this is an evolving story just like the transfer portal it's one of the biggest things and really the biggest thing to hit college athletics right now so a big big thank you to him for spending time with us and just lending his expertise and context and thank you again to all of you for listening uh we'll be back again in a couple of weeks and uh again stay tuned to alscoop.com for all of our coverage and content and uh we'll talk to you soon 